All right, now we're recording. All right, okay. Everybody here. Twenty-two. So. Cool. Okay. Uh, wait a couple more minutes, you think? Yeah, I'll wait another minute. Uh, I always try and do something with um, cybersecurity. Oh, was there an announcement uh, for the cybersecurity club? Yeah, uh, we'll meet tomorrow at three o'clock. So I, I mean, like uh, confirm that, yes. Is it Friday? Friday at three o'clock? Friday, but yeah, between three and four. Yeah. Okay, and um, oh, there was something else, Jonathan. You had mentioned to me, oh, about the ACM, and that's all computer science students have the ability to receive an ACM membership as a student, which provides you membership to a professional organization for computer science professionals. And that's free to you if you haven't already done so. Uh, Tam, I believe, did that, but you can reach out to her and get that, and it has a bunch of learning and training resources. Jonathan, you want to talk about that for a second? Uh, I, I do. In the beginning, we had assumed that it might have only been just some basic memberships, which did not give you full access uh, to a larger digital library. And what I found out was that these memberships that the university is covering are actually much more in depth and they do provide a number of open uh, digital resources. Among them was a tab I noted as the O'Reilly tab and the O'Reilly company puts out a lot of textbooks out into, into the, uh, uh, out into the world. And I noted a number of films much like it, as I may have mentioned to you, Mark, that looked like the same type of instructional videos that you normally have to pay for either through LinkedIn or through other premium services. And it covered, when I say it covered, we're talking things that engineers would like, that uh, cybersecurity guys would like, uh, coders would like, uh, plus all of the current issues that they publish in their media uh, that, that you can get free as well. So no matter what type of services that you're looking for and no matter what your major is, I would definitely recommend taking uh, the university up on those ACM memberships. They are good for the year, but within that year, you'd have so much material that you could then refer to and then bolster your existing resume. It's just, it, I was surprised. Uh, it's a little kind of, not chaotic, but you do have to learn to navigate the site a little bit. But after that, I found connections to virtually every major, and I thought maybe it was something worthwhile that should be mentioned. So, um, and I'd like to um, add up on top of that that you don't have to contact him. So I dropped the link right there. You don't have to email anybody. You just need to fill that out, then you're good to go. Um, they they would have to ACM have to verify uh, the the membership or whatnot, but usually it takes less than a couple of days. So just go to this link and drop it off. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, the library, which usually 40, uh, $47, I believe, um, are covered. So you would have lots of lots of resource access. That's including technical uh, textbooks, magazines, or news or whatnot that you would only be able to see when you have that access. So it'll going to be a good opportunity. Yeah. All right, that's good info. Um, let's see here. Right. So last time we were talking, uh, we were talking about uh, data centers and uh, basically how big they could get and, and how the big guys, you know, take care of them and uh, talking about cooling and uh, planning out for that type of thing. Um, today, we're going to go and uh, take a look at how St. Martin's uh, does our, I guess, mini data center. We actually have four of them here on campus, so we, we kind of spread them out uh, so that we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, as it were. Um, but yeah, uh, when you are talking the big guys, they you have a very, very large budget 
And so a smaller or medium size, uh, then you have to balance um, how much uh, you want to plan for your, your uh, data centers and uh, how much you want to put in the cloud. Uh, when we talk about the cloud, that's when the, the, we're talking about putting something in a data center as far as your data um, or computational. Um, you can either store or uh, uh, or like uh, make a program and and uh, execute that program on computing uh, resources out in the cloud, which would be in a data center. So, um, so here, uh, when you're a smaller company, you have to you have to balance what you how how much uh, you want to. Um, uh, Spend, I guess you could say, on uh, on, on your computing resources um, because you can you get to the point where you get to chase the nines is what they call it. Uh, so, for example, say you want 99% uptime, and if you've got a big data center that just has uh, you know a couple thousand computers uh, or not computers but servers in it, um, that would mean that one percent of them are not online. And uh, so, in order to get to 99.9%, you're going to end up spending a lot more with more cooling, more reliability, more redundancy. Um, basically, you may end up uh, getting uh, redundant servers together so that if one server goes down, the other one can take over for it. So, you're, you're doubling your cost uh, in doing that type of thing. So, um, it's just a matter of how much. Uh, the balancing act, um, but some of the big guys, they, they even go uh, redundant data centers. You might have a data center on one side of the country or a data center on the other side of the country. They do that for reliability as well as uh, um, as well as uh, oh, what do you want to call it? Uh, speed, latency. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So adding to what he's saying if you have a specific availability then people talk about five nines if you look 99.999 that's five nines yep you literally can only your data center can only be down 5.26 minutes per year 25.9 seconds per month and six seconds downtime per week <laughs> so it's a very very um, high bar to shoot for, and it can only, like Peter's talking about, can be accomplished through redundancy at all aspects. Yep. And if you're a big investment company, you know, you're making billions of dollars uh, every second, you know, it takes it, you can, you're talking about lots and lots of money every millisecond. So, yeah, the, some of this stuff really matters if you're one of these big guys that deals with lots and lots of money. So, uh, Whereas here we're kind of a medium-sized or small-sized organization, so we don't really have everything on redundant, but we try to do what we can, um, you know, within a, a budgetary constraint. So that's why we have four separate locations for data centers. We've got three clusters that are in the three different locations. Uh, we're going to look at our fourth area, which is where all the networks are at, um, as well as uh, some of the servers that we have here on campus that aren't in a cluster. And a cluster is basically just a group of computers that all work together um, for virtual machines and things like that. So Peter, Peter's, uh, when he was talking about redundant data centers, when you're big enough, you can have redundant data centers for failover uh, between the two of them for backup. Um, uh, for redundancy in uh, data storage, uh, even services that fail over between the two. But there's also a thing called edge networks or content delivery networks, CDNs. And those are, even though you may have your data centers for your customers or clients or even internal data center, you can have content delivery networks that are on the edge of the internet, right where people come in that last mile, uh, right after they do the final mile that comes in to say your house or something that you have right as they get to their internet service provider like Comcast, they have like a Google server 
And so Google and others, Facebook, they put this edge content in this content delivery networks right at the edge so that it's, a, it's very fast. The latency, the round trip time between you and Google or you and Facebook or whoever, Amazon is super fast this way. But then of course you've got a massively distributed uh, server infrastructure all over the world for these major content delivery networks. But that's like when you type Google and it immediately pops up and you type a search and in less than a second, you have 4 million results. That's how they're doing this is these edge networks. So it's another element beyond even redundancy. Uh, Mark, I had a quick question for you. Uh, what you just mentioned, of course, describes Google and larger uh, search engine operations and things that, that we all globally use. Um, is that also being applied to things more personal, such as the VMs that we might, might design ourselves? Are they simply able to transmit maybe imagery of those VMs to a closer edge uh, uh, a server? Well, these content uh, delivery can be, they are closer, and but some of these can be actually just a, um, a proxy server or reverse proxy. So it's a caching, it's caching content from a, say a major data center to the edge. And so what you do is you hit the cache okay. and it's basically cached content or basically it's stored in memory to fast deliver to you of the original content back in your data center. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And just for reliability sake, they may actually take a copy of your VM and back it up someplace on the other side of the country or even the world. Um, yes, it okay. was uh, possible to do that. Yeah, that's right. You could, yeah, a copy of it. It could be running in another data center, just sitting there idle, but not um, enabled. And, uh, and immediately with a failover, it could redirect to that other data center. So things like that. So there's a bunch of different uh, redundant design type, data center type design types for applications. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Peter, I just uh, thought it, it, it was a brilliant explanation of going through the CDN and, and how it's applied. Uh, also noted was one of the terms on bandwidth. I know that when certain areas start to suffer an overload of bandwidth, and that same technology can be used to maybe assign an area that's not so heavily bombarded to work and still keep up your same throughput without being choked through an area that might be uh, overloaded. Um, would that be a fair assessment? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and in fact, uh, that's one of the ways to mitigate against uh, denial of service attacks uh, is to just uh, basically give up one of your locations and let the other one uh, handle all the traffic instead. So, yep. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so, Peter, how much time do you need for the data center tour today? Do you want to, uh, because uh, then we can do some review before that if we got time. Yeah, let's do some review. Yeah, it's only going to take maybe a half an hour um, okay. to run up there. And, and, uh, so we'll stop through. at 10 till. So we've yeah. got then uh, maybe 30 minutes, half an hour here. Okay. Yeah, that'll work. So let me share my screen and let's just review some of the things we, we talked about yesterday and we'll add to what we did. All right. So if. Um, Here we have some physical design elements. We talked about yesterday at the very top here, we talked about this uh, chicken coop design, right? Uh, with Yahoo data centers. And um, this design, what type of cooling design is the chicken coop? Do you remember what terms we used? We'll be referring to the open loop versus the closed loop. Yes. So what would a chicken coop be? If I understood the design correctly, they were drawing in outside volumes of air. So that means it would be an open loop in some of those cases. That's right. It's an open loop 
what an open loop means is you're actually, uh, you're pulling in um, external air that's already cold or cooler than what you need to cool your equipment. And um, then you uh, exhaust it again outside. But a closed loop, you don't introduce new air. It's just the same air recirculated over and over and over. And a closed loop is going to be very good at reducing particulate count. It's going to be, it's not going to introduce any new dust or smoke or pollution or anything like that from outside. It's going to be very, it's climate, it's not only is it climate control, but it's also humidity controlled and everything. And so uh, it's, it's a very clean uh, and controlled data center. An open loop is a lot more variance. You've got cold air coming in, but it's, it's different different degrees based on the outside ambient temperature of the air. And um, it has different humidity levels. So it can be more humid or less humid depending on what type of weather you're having in that area. And if there's a forest fire, you're gonna suck in smoke right into your data center, okay? Uh, if it's a dust storm, it's got some filtering, but that dust is probably going to come into your data center as well. So when you have an open loop, You've got a lot of variables, but they found over years of, of study of, of, the, uh, of, um, of servers that they used to think they had to be in a very controlled environment and they don't necessarily have to be so much. In fact, um, they have uh, units that they have tested. In fact, there was a test that was done at Intel where they put a bunch of servers, IBM servers, at the time they were IBM, you know, Intel based servers into a, uh, it was basically a trailer and they just sucked in outside air, no filtering, wide fluctuation in temperature and humidity. This is in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And um, it was, was it for a whole year. And then they had IBM and now analyze and test, cut these things open, break them down and see if the mean time between failure, okay, the MTBF mean time between failure had been um, reduced in any way. And mean time between failure means the average time uh, for how long a server or other IT equipment will work or that, that time between failures. And so if a server has a, you know, and all the components, you have the mean time between failure for a hard drive, a network interface card, a, um, a processor, a RAM, stick of RAM memory. And uh, those all have failure rates or mean time between failure in hours is what, how they're measured. And so did that, did that affect the mean time between failure of a server? And it didn't really significantly impact it. So then they realized, well, we're spending all this money to cool this air and filter it and um, keep it very sanitary and clean. And when we really don't need to, we can save a lot of money by just using an open loop. I mean, I was in that trailer and I swiped my finger across the top of a blade server and it had maybe a quarter inch of dust on the top. So all that dust and crap was being sucked through the fans on top of those um, servers and the motherboards. And um, it did not in significant way impact the failure rate. And so that's why they've gone to more of an open loop uh, recently as a newer design to save money on cooling, you know, instead of using electricity to cool hot air, just suck it in from outside and blow it out, back out the heated air back outside and not try and cool it again. So open loop is a best practice or a newer best practice for a data center design in cooling, but that it's not always uh, what you want, depending on what your data center is, but a lot of it is now. And um, uh, so that was open loop and closed loop. We talked about PUE, power usage effectiveness. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. Now, if I said on a quiz, what is the best PUE? 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.1 or 1.2 or 2.0, right? You would think, some people would think, well, the lowest one, 0 0.6, but there is nothing lower 
than 1.0 because it is a is the mathematical formula of all power coming into the data center divided by IT equipment power. So you can never get better than one. 1.0 is perfect. All power coming in is going to IT equipment and that's theoretical, okay? Well, I have a question, Dr. Mark. Um, I know this might seem like a weird question, but what does the uh, average data center, like their electric bill would be? Uh, that's a good question. Peter, you won't have any insight in that? Uh, well, um, as far as I know, like, like the big guys, sometimes they'll have an entire power generator for themselves, like a, uh, a you know, a, a dam power generator or a, uh, a coal fired power, power generator. So, so they, the costs for power are their own, you know, however much they pay for coal or if it's a uh, uh, green energy, then how much it costs to run the solar panels and all that. So, um, yeah, and obviously if they're not using their own, uh, then they're buying power from a power company. And of course, the more power you purchase from them, they, they get big discounts for that. So uh, I'm sure it runs anywhere from a couple hundred thousand or more. It depends on how much, uh, um, how many servers they're trying to use and, and how much power it draws. So it's got to be a lot, though. That mo the majority of your costs for the uh, uh, data center are going to be in power. And Mark, I um I would like to clarify something about uh, on the MTVF. So, are I if I I might miss miss here what you were talking about. Um, but did you did you say that's how long will it take to work it back, or how long does it take to get another failure? Or meantime mean time between failure? Yeah. Well, mean time between failure is basically they run tests and they they just spin up, uh, let's say, hard drives and they run those hard drives until they fail, and it's in hours and it's usually in the tens of thousands of hours, and you can look up MTBF for different components and they'll give it to you. Uh, no, no, I just want to clarify. Thank you very much. It's... Oh, so it's yeah, it's it, it the, the the actual definition can be time between failures, or really it's it's time to the first failure or between failures is what the mean time between failure is, yeah. yeah. Average Thank time, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and this is a site here, okay, where it's power in the data center. And um, this is giving an average, but uh, electricity rates vary significantly based on the contract that you can get with your power provider, like Peter Truax said, the bigger you are and the closer you are to uh, certain uh, power plants or um, hydroelectric power, uh, you can get a better better cost possibly, depending on how much you're gonna consume. And, um, but it says electricity rates can vary significantly across the country. So the savings can be dramatic. Um, let's see here. So Washington, 0.05 per cents, so five cents per kilowatt hour. If you use a thousand kilowatt hours, annual cost is 400,000 in electricity. Um, but that same at 15 cents is 1.2 million. So depending where you put that, there's a huge difference in cost for your data center and uh, if you're smart about it, you can be saving, in this case, they're saving close to a million dollars by having a, uh, a better placement and a better rate per kilowatt hour for a large data center. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a huge amount. And of course, this is a annual cost that is they're paying, uh, can be a million, depending on how big, million, two million um, or less. Uh, right in there. So you can see this is huge money every year that they're forking out for power. And hey Mark, I had a, another kind of quick question for both you and Peter. Um, I, I did read somewhere, obviously, that since like 2006, obviously, that a lot of the centers keep converting to ways to save 
on the power consumption. And, and one of those questions might be in converting not just over to fiber optic in almost every input, but also the idea that um, they have uh, gone to not just SSDs, but a type of technology where the actual memory and the actual circuitry of the devices themselves, you know, don't use a lot of moving parts. They're not using very large inefficient power supplies. The PDUs have reduced. Is there any view that, that everything is going to be virtually an in-memory kind of SSD environment at some point? Yeah, so that, that all is true. Um, I mean, it, there's many factors for um, equipment improvements, but it is the reduction in power is a big one. Every generation of Intel chip was a reduction in power. They had a TikTok model where they had a new design every other year, and then they would shrink the die it was like the odd year you shrink the die and then it was a new architecture the even year so they had this tick tock back and forth throughout the years but they've that's come to a halt uh with size reduction they're they're kind of at a standstill they're they're, they're having their own problem but anyway what the, when they every time they would shrink the die uh it would reduce power consumption and uh, even with a new architecture it would increase performance but uh, even you'd have more, more transistors and resistors and so forth in the, the silicon, in the chip, but uh, it typically, uh, the, it was way more capable. So it was, it's performance to power ratio. And um, so all of these things, improvements in, in performance, but also reductions in power. So it had this back and forth each year with their design model at Intel. And uh, you're right that it's reducing power, reducing power in the server overall. And um, it uh, is improving the efficiency of power supplies to go from 95% efficient to 98% efficient. SSDs, they reduce the heat generation and they increase the or decrease the power consumption by 10 times by going to a solid state drive without any moving parts. So all those things are reducing power consumption. And um, the more you can reduce the heat that, that is expelled, that has to be cooled, uh, the more you reduce the power that's consumed by every server and all the components within that server, then you are saving money all, overall in your data center. I wanted to add too that um, inadvertently by reducing the size of all of those components and, and machinery, one of the underlying causes, at least from an administrative point, will be the square foot charge. So if you've got a data center sitting in downtown Seattle, they could be charging you a price per square foot that's monstrous as compared, you know, to, um, you know, old man Johnson's farm 20 miles away where you, you could get to virtually, you know, nothing per acre as a cost. And some of those guys may pay up to $20,000, you know, a, a month just to simply take up floor space. So. Yeah, the, uh, I was going to add that um, uh, not only do you get the increases in um, or reduction in power and all that, but also you get a uh, reduction in cost just because you're able to uh, do more computing power at the same, for the same amount of servers or as uh, Jonathan was saying, the floor space. So. Yeah. So I was trying to think of his connection to Moore's law. I know that Moore's law had come up in a lot of, you know, initial discussions about computing power and, and mega flops, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So for the most part, Moore's law has uh, been pretty consistent, although recently with the uh, processors, it's kind of leveled off. Um, yeah. They, they, they kind of hit the limit in physical size. And you can't really go a whole lot smaller without running into quantum effects. So. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, Quincy, Washington. This is the site of a Microsoft Azure data center for the public cloud. And they're not the only ones here. If you zoom out, all of those round green spots are farms. So it's a big farming community. You'll notice that you are right beside the Columbia River. You are on the east side of the Cascades, cheap land, uh, cheap hydroelectric power, cheap property taxes, 
and cheap engineering resources. People don't live here. The guy I talked to that works at Microsoft, that works, well, one of many, that works in their data center, he lives in Ellensburg, okay? It's so about 30, 40 minutes away. If you look at these big uh, buildings over here, okay? If you look at these, these are fruit warehouses, okay? Double diamond fruit, okay? You see these? These are just a standard fruit warehouse. These are all those, those uh, wooden crates where they, where they put the apples in and stuff, right? Or the pears or whatever, okay? But across the railroad tracks, you have some other warehouses. Take a look at these warehouses, okay? Is this, uh, we'll refresh. You have a lot of power and cooling resources that are not needed in a regular fruit warehouse, okay? Many times they do not label these because they don't want them to be targeted. They're very generic, uh, but the, if you go to, you'll see a little sign from Microsoft. I think Dell and Apple also have um, uh, data centers here, but look at the cooling towers outside that they have along the way to cool for, um, for their saltwater uh, cooling. And um, here's your redundant generators right here in the middle between these two here. And uh, you can see there is um, uh, also, uh, there's, there's one here. I'm not sure which one theirs is, but um, I wanna say it's this one here, but if you go to the street level, I, you can't go all the way up to these with a street level view in Google Maps, but I wanna say this is theirs right here. And there's some other ones as well that are obviously not fruit warehouses. Here's one here, massive. Maybe this one's there. See the cooling tower and the water, the chiller with the water tower there and all the cooling towers there with the fans. Okay, it's um, for massive air conditioning within these data centers. Here is your substation, I think right here for the power coming in. Uh, these are using, yeah, probably a million dollars plus in power every year for these data centers. That's the closest one to us. And of course the location is key. When you put a data center, it's all the costs of uh, engineering, uh, power, real estate, uh, taxes. Um, and of course you have other, other consideration you wouldn't think of. You cannot be or shouldn't be in the direct flight path of a major airport in case somebody hijacked an airline and crashed it into your data center. There's a whole bunch of weird things you wouldn't think of initially, but, um, but there's a million things in a site selection checklist for you to determine where you're gonna put your data center. So it looks like they've got their own substation. This may be the substation that's feeding all of these data centers. There's several here from different companies in Quincy. So here you got a little farming community and then you have a massive power consumption between these data centers right here along this, this route and then over to here, right here. So these and these and this here. Uh, and uh, somebody drove this, it went over just stopped by and then they said, this is the one, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but anyway, yeah. Mark, you just made me think of a really strange question to ask you. So forgive me if I'm asking a company secret that you may not be able to share, but would we be able to find out uh, what the average uh, information density is? Like is a data center ever allowed to go uh, you know, above a certain amount of, of uh, storage, so to speak, before they know that they either have to divert or consider putting another <laughs> data center to work or yeah. et cetera? They they have they have um, they have calculations by um, um, power uh, computational fluid dynamic uh, and power modeling. Um, uh, Future facilities is one company that I've used that can actually determine. It says if I put in five more servers and all these, or I put in a thousand more servers, how close am I to maximizing the power uh, output? You only have so much power coming into these data centers, and um, depending how you've designed it. Some of that is going to cooling and other things. Um, if it's open loop, then it's a lot less, but you have, a, you have a compute density where you can only cool so much based on your cooling capacity, and you can only power so much based on your power capacity 
for the different circuits coming into your, your data center. And so when you hit those maximums, which is you, you never hit your max, but when you get close to 70% of your max, then you, you gotta, you gotta be looking at building another data center. Yeah. Okay. I've even heard rumors that they, there were even contingencies for uh, the new diesel engines, of course, are literally can power small cities. But if there was an emergency or a contingency plan for an area where a data center might be under duress uh, for some reason that they had ways to, to power it separately. But Well, you uh, have ways to drop in additional capacity if you need be. Remember when he talked about container data centers? Yes. So if you have efficient, you have enough power, but you don't have enough cooling or you don't have enough, you've run out of space, you could drop additional um, temporary uh, container storage in container data centers where you've got compute in a kind of just a, a block of compute and storage. You could just drop it in and just start adding those in as needed and, um, and add to a data center as maybe a, a fix, uh, maybe you're, while you're building another, a large data center or something to, to replace this or, or enhance this or whatever. And in addition to that, there's also uh, formulas for the amount of compute and storage you want to build in as well. Or like how much, if you buy say a hundred gig hard drive or a hundred, a hundred terabyte hard drive, you can't um, fill it up an entire hundred terabytes on it. It, it, doesn't, it will slow down the entire system if you do that. So they've got um, uh, formulas and computing uh, formulas for both the amount of uh, CPU processing as well as the amount of storage that you can use um, for the hardware that you buy. Right, now I've seen some of those in place when you're looking at Azure or a number of sites that look at the efficiency of when you're setting up. They have all those formulas actually working to assist you when you build your own VMs on their site. So that, that makes absolute sense. So. Thank you yeah. both, I appreciate that. Okay, so talk about location, power consumption. Um, there is, uh, have you heard of LEED certification? It's a green data center certification, you've heard of this? Well, Fabula Hall is LEED certified. That's right. Yeah, LEED certified and you have different, you have different certification levels. It's platinum, gold, silver, and, and certified. And uh, Cebula is platinum. So it's the highest certification, but that, that is the actual building and the construction of your, of your building in how efficient it is, whether using um, uh, uh, specific materials, recycled materials, if you're using, um, we have solar panels both on the, on the ceiling as well as those two solar panels that move with the rotation of the sun to collect power. Uh, the way that you recapture or uh, cool the building, the way you light it with you have open, open windows and do use natural lighting versus using you know just regular lighting like electric lights. And all those things matter. In fact, that middle area, the quad where you walk through where the grass is always dead because they don't have sprinklers there in the summer. That is part of the building for Cebula and it has geothermal cooling or heating in the winter. And that's why they didn't put a sprinkler system because that would have reduced the total points. They need to have 80 points for platinum certification and that would have reduced their points and they would have dropped down into the gold or something. Uh, my understanding from Dean Olwell. And so the, uh, that's why they don't have sprinklers there. And the, I think you get recertified every five years or something for your building. Anyway, so yeah, it just basically shows you how efficient your building is, and it's also a a point of pride to be lead certified to say that we're using uh, best practices for conserving energy and recycling materials and things like that. Okay, we talked about power being the largest operational cost in a data center. 
beyond even the data center purchase and build and, and IT equipment. We talk about closed loop, open loop. Open loop can be uh, free cooling, they call it. And now we also have, we talked about the ceiling plenum, that's that area where you can run uh, hot air back to be cooled in a closed loop. It's also where wiring will go and power. You have to have power and data, copper data cables, at least a foot apart. And when they cross, they have to cross at a 90 degree angle because electricity creates a, a magnetic field around it. And as that crosses by copper wires that uh, typically are not the best insulated, usually on uh, um, UTP um, wire, and it can affect the data because data again is sent through copper wires with volt of their own voltages, plus five voltage for a one bit and a minus five volts for a negative bit. And if you mess with those voltages by some magnetic field because of power lines or power cables running too close, then your data packets are corrupted. They can be messed up, those bits and so forth. So ultimately, you have to be careful or you can, um, uh, you can slow your network down or you can uh, cripple it even with um, a poor design with not separating your power and your, your data cables. Maybe um, Peter can add to that some too. Um, the only thing I could add is uh, the, the wiring in the plenum has to be plenum rated. Uh, that's actually a fire code um, uh, rating. So usually the wiring that's for plenum rated is just uh, more expensive. Uh, it's it's uh, definitely something you have to plan for. Hey, Peter and Mark, I could uh, bolster both the uh, sides of that by saying that one of the reasons for the category selection on, on cabling is to use twisted pair for the various in the copper that, that, that Mark has so adeptly pointed out that with, with copper, you have to twist the pairs that so whenever the information is transmitted goes through it, the electrical fields don't induce or, or create, you know, excessive crosstalk. So there's so many twists per inch is required when creating a, a, a standard for some of the twisted pair cabling so that you do not have that kind of, of uh, electrical interference. That also applies to the open ends of the cabling, if I remember right, where if you have open copper, uh, where signaling goes through, if it's longer than a certain amount from the end of an end connector, that can also generate issues. So um, very, very clear standards on not having exposed copper and making sure, as Mark pointed out, that they're at uh, tight twist or at 90 degree angles to nullify the effect of, of, of any uh, magnetic or electrical crosstalk between the wires. Yep, uh, I believe we're going to be going over all the different uh, standards for cabling and all that uh, at one point in our class discussion uh, for various copper as well as fiber optics. Okay, so here are steps to improve design for your data center. And um, Many data centers that I've been in, I've been in data centers all over the world, uh, from Singapore to India to uh, Tokyo, um, not just down in Silicon Valley, but um, when I've gone into these, many of them are older data centers because life, uh, a data center is an expensive thing to build and they want, the life cycle is 20 to 30 years. So you could have, have many different generations of servers, mainframes, Vax, Unix, whatever in there, and uh, your data center has to design and get modified to deal with newer designs. But, but what we found is, is like we talked about last time, you need a hot aisle, cold aisle. Many people just have racks, but they, they face in the same direction. So as hot air is expelled out the back of one rack, it gets mixed with cold air and gets sucked in to the next rack and then it's already hotter and so forth as it goes um, all the way along the rows of, of uh, your data center and can um, affect the efficiency. So switching the faces so that rows are facing each other uh, create this hot, this cold aisle and then where they are opposite, they're not facing each other, creates the area where all the hot air is, is exhausted 
and that's your hot oil. So switching that is the first thing and then putting in actual panels. Okay. Actually, um, um, uh, this is hot aisle, cold aisle, and then isolating hot or cold with um, paneling. Okay. And um, that can be plastic. It can be uh, flexible sheets of plastic, it can be thin particle board, it can be a lot of different things, it can be glass, whatever. But isolating that hot or cold air uh, with paneling and um, uh, to, if it's a closed loop, uh, and venting back to the plenum area. Okay. So, um, another issue is that air can escape through the middle of one of these air can escape. If you have a rack like this, okay, and um, Air can come around the side. It can come up over the top, hot air that is, from the back, from the hot aisle. It can come through the middle of this, this rack here over on the left. It's wide open. So hot air can just come through, right through that rack, and then get mixed back in with the cold air in the front. And so one of the things you do is you put these blanking panels in. Okay. This here is just... Uh, some stuff that looks like servers, but it's not, it's just paper, but it's blocking hot air from coming back and mixing with the cold air. Typically though, it's an actual just aluminum panel painted like that, like this middle square here where we just bolt it in so that your rack doesn't have this. They can be one U where you just snap them in like this, you just snap in one U blanking panels to block that cold air or the hot air from coming back and recirculating into the cold aisle. So these are different, different, um, uh, and, and companies sell these, some kind of snap in like this. These are plastic ones uh, that I've used from Dell and uh, you just snap them in, they kind of clip in that, you know, so that way it just blocks that and makes it a wall there so that uh, it makes it hard for hot air to, to recirculate. That's what you don't want is hot air to come back through the middle and then re and then re get introduced to the cold aisle because then all of those servers up above it then uh, are getting overheated. They don't have the same efficiency. The cold air is not getting to them like it, it should be uh, to cool. I am going to stop my video and I'm going to run up the, to the uh, data center. So um, continue to talk. I'll be back in just a minute. All right. Sounds good. Hey, Mark, I've, uh, you, you got me thinking about so many questions. With the absolute uh, uh, focus right now on these, uh, like you're talking about the blank paneling and the room design and the overall design to move the air through, Within each cabinet, has there been engineering considerations for a working cabinet with a number of pieces of, inf of, of equipment that's working to where the internal flow is also assisted by keeping the blank plates in? Yes, uh, they, they've done a bunch of studies with this. Uh, and, uh, they've actually done designs to improve the design of server racks so that uh, it eliminates, uh, that's not what I wanted, future facilities. Why is this all rocket stuff? Uh, I was looking for more like this, but okay. Uh, you can see these models. These are these are models that I've done. They look like this. You see how the airflow is being blown down underneath, and this yes. is an active model where it's blown underneath a raised floor, and then it's 
It comes up through perforated tiles, it gets sucked in, but you'll notice that there's no isolation. So the, the hot air is recirculating back around and getting sucked in the front again, uh, but you've got that hot aisle in the middle there where those rows are you know, not facing each other, where the air is going up and it's slowly working its way back to the top. At the very top of that crack unit over on the right, it's sucking the hot air back in and cooling it and then blowing it back out once it's been cooled with its own fans underneath. So, so isolation is literally putting panels up. You ready? Can you? Uh, All right, yeah. Peter. So, so if you notice, this is this is our IT department. Say hi, Garrett. This is a class. Yep. He's a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you notice, we have a lock. So everything's behind a locked door. In fact, this one's behind a card swipe door. So uh, you always want to have your data center secure. Let me know if you can't hear because it's a little noisy in here. This is our data center. We have racks, servers. This is what they call a KVM. So basically, it's a keyboard and monitor, all in one. Oh, I see. We got Neil here. Say hi, Neil. <laughs> um, hey, Neil. But anyway, hi, so Neil. you can actually manage your your server um, right here, or without remoting in. So you can actually work on the actual machine. Uh, right here, and everything slides in and out of the rack. We have another rack. This particular one, this this server here is our, our uh, camera server, but it's got a big data storage beneath it that it's connected to. And that's what all these are. These are all hard drives. And then underneath, these are battery backups. We have two per rack. And one of those is on uh, one of those is on um, generator. The other one is not, and just because the uh, the generator can't handle both of them at the same time. And Neil found a, a hard drive that went bad, so we have to replace the hard drive. So all the drives and everything are all done in a redundant array, arrayed, and uh, so that way if the drive fails. You just pop the uh, new one in and it uh, all works. It just uh, automatically. Uh, you see that it make sure it wasn't just a super yeah, problem. it automatically uh, 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 fixes itself. So this one, it looks like it's it's on, but it might fail again. But it might fail again later. So we're we're gonna look at it. It's part of our job. Over here, this is the rack for the internet as well as the uh, building uh, network uh, here on the main floor. Up above, you see all these cabling. These are all Cat5 cables for this main floor. And they all come down into these racks here. Um, if you notice, we have very, very high ceilings in here. That's where the hot side is, is actually on the, at the top of the ceiling. We have, um, uh, air conditioning units there and there to provide cooling for the racks themselves. Um, and then as far as network goes, our main router is right here. The Cisco router, it's on a back backup below. We have a Palo Alto firewall in a redundant uh, setup to where one is active, one is passive. And then that goes into our main core switch here, which is also a router. Um, all of these cables that you see here, these are uh, the yellow and the orange, they're all fiber optic cables. And these all go to the individual buildings around campus. So I get this distributed all over campus from here. So the actual switches that are here, um, those are for the, this main floor. We actually have three closets that have um, uh, switches in them for each floor of the, the library here. The fiber optics come into a, a box 
um, to where they're terminated at, and then they're all hooked up with these patch cords, these fiber optic patch cords. This goes up above and down into the core switch. So right now we, we've got a, a new core switch that is a Cisco. The old core switch, you can see my finger here, is a Dell. Um, we're slowly moving everything over to the, the new Cisco one. It's uh, much faster. Uh, actually can handle 480 gigabits a second. Yeah. And then up above, that's our service provider, which is CenturyLink. And they have fiber optics coming down into the service provider router down below. So that, are there any questions that you guys have? Pretty much how it works around here. Uh, we have another battery back up on the floor for the uh, the, uh, the, the network and equipment side. Yeah, so give them a uh, talk about where the feed is from the internet and then how you limit, rate limit for all the students. I think that's interesting. Okay. Well, and just go slow with your movement so it can focus on it. Oh, I'm, and, uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm moving too fast. Huh? Okay, so this pipe here, this orange one, actually, this one here, I believe, that's our main feed of fiber optic cabling and that comes around down into like i said before our service provider switch um which then gets fed to fiber optics down to their their bgp router and it talks to bgp and then that comes into our palo alto firewall which is where everything gets filtered limited and uh, basically, um, you know, it, it, this is where like all the VPN connections go into, as well as uh, anything that's filtered uh, through the internet. Like if you went to a website that we weren't supposed to go to, this would catch it. From there, it goes to the uh, core switch, which then goes up to all the other buildings. But uh, you limit if somebody downloads a file, they can't. They don't have access to your gigabit or two gigabit feed, right? Um. Yes and no. Uh, we we try not to limit the speed too much, uh, just because uh, we have a lot of bandwidth available. Uh, we've got a gig and a, or two gig uh, pipe going up the internet. And that's, uh, we, we very rarely use more than like four to 500 megabits. So we have lots of bandwidth to play with. So we don't really limit a whole lot as far as speeds go. Uh, back when we had a 500 megabits limit, yes, we had a packet shaper that would limit the speeds of everybody. Everybody had, like each individual person had, I wanna say 30 megs to play with, but we, since gotten rid of that and, and gone to a much more open. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's new. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. So if we wanted to to limit the bandwidth on that, we could with a QoS on either the, the Cisco or the uh, Palo Alto. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I had a question for you. Is there a way that you test or diagnostically would check out what what the uh, whether or not your bandwidth is capable of getting to, or do you, is there a, a moment that you go test to see if you can actually pump that much data through it? Yes. Okay. We can. Uh, generally, we, uh, I use uh, speedtest.net um, to check to see how fast things would go. Um, obviously, when most connections, especially copper, are going to be limited to a gigabit. The, the, uh, the gigabit speeds will it only go that fast. Um, so in order to, to check the speed that we now have a two gig pipe, uh, we have servers that are connected via fiber that go 10 gig. So, um, so that's how we check it. We check it from one of those servers. And yes, we have quite a lot of bandwidth to play with. So one thing maybe people don't realize is when you said, here's our vendor router, that piece of equipment 
uh, St. Martin's does not own the the internet service provider owns that, right? Correct. So they have a piece of equipment in there that has been provided as the termination for their internet service provider, uh, K was it K twenty, right? Yep, K twenty. And so they that's how K twenty, if they can get to that router and make changes, they that's their piece of equipment. Their login and they manage that. They manage the connection all the way to that that box. And then from that box, then St. Martin's has to troubleshoot any problems from there into their network, right? Right. And this little box right here, this is actually connected to their router. This is their, their little box. It's a cell phone, uh, uh, I guess, receiver. And then that gets connected to a uh, USB cable. And they were able to manage this, this uh, device if, if the network went out. So they can actually go and configure things or restart the, uh, the box if they needed to um, remotely uh, via cell phone signal. Uh, if you also notice, it's got redundant power as well. And then a battery back up below. So that five, those fiber optic uh, connectors right there are called SFP plus, and there's different kinds of connectors. When you buy a switch, you've got to decide, okay, what type of cable cabling do I have? Or what type of connector do I want? And then you've got to have the correct it's called, they're called GBICs. Those are little uh, connectors that can be plugged in and out, which create the, uh, the light uh, pulse. And it can be a laser or an LED driven, uh, depending on the distance that it goes. You also have to determine multi-mode, single mode fiber, all those are elements that see that. This is a little GBIC that actually is purchased that just slides into that slot that generates the, uh, LED light pulses for your data to go across that fiber optic cable and they just pop out and slide in. And each of those is like a couple hundred bucks. So the stuff adds it up quick. Yeah, actually, um, believe it or not, they've come down in price a lot. Um, we recently purchased a whole group of these that are, are 10 gigabit. Um, I think they run about $25 each. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So they really come down in price. But yeah, I remember the days when they were three, four hundred dollars. Um, when they were pretty much brand new. And in the case of fiber, those two combined is one. Yeah, you have a transmit and a receive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so one is transmitting, one is receiving into those two different different filaments that are received into that GBA connector. So um, uh, that's that's one thing to just know about fiber optic. So you know, the, the, the orange ones are what's called multi-mode fiber, and the yellow ones are single-mode fiber. And what? Why would you have multi-mode versus single-mode? Well, the multi-mode is an older, um, uh, I guess, specification. It used to be very cheap. Um, it's actually plastic on the inside rather than uh, glass. And so, yeah, uh, the university, when they first did fiber optics from the library to Old Main, they used uh, the multi-mode stuff. Uh, as time went on, uh, single-mode fiber became more affordable, and that's what we actually have running to all of the other buildings, uh, which is a much more modern, uh, future-proof type of uh, technology. Uh, multi-mode, um, you're kind of limited on distance and speed, whereas single mode is pretty much what they use uh, at any of the carrier uh, grade um, levels. You can go kilometers with the uh, distance on them. So, uh, and so it's just a, a much better quality cable. So I believe my, we don't have to worry about the set so much. Yeah, so cost and single mode is long, long distance. In fact, a single mode is such that um, that is ran across the actual bed of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to actually get to different tone lines. So that's the distances. And at certain points, uh, 
it also attenuates in those fiber optic cables so they have spots in the, in the ocean that have uh, repeaters that amplify the digital signal and send it on uh, so you have a digital signal uh, that's going to go across the fiber optic cable all the way even underneath the ocean okay, on the ocean floor in a big bundle you're going across one of those fiber optics when you access resources in another country so here i'm showing uh the Cybersecurity club's server they have their own server as they run a virtual environment uh, inside it that has its own virtual network and virtual uh, computing systems in there um, as well as a virtual firewall so if you join the Cybersecurity club you get to play with that <laughs> um but anyway so then we also have a uh, PlaySite is a, uh, a camera server for the uh, athletics department. Uh, NetManage, this is what uh, is our registration system. DC, domain controllers for uh, joining uh, for authenticating users. And we have several of those around campus for redundancy purposes. And then this is our mail server. Uh, I'm not sure what these others are. Uh, another group. The main controller. I think this one. Yeah. yeah, there we go. This one's inoperable. It's an old server. We just have it shut off. So yeah, that's pretty much our little little data center here. We, like I said, we have four of them on campus, and they're all kind of the same size. This so one just happens to be the the main hub for uh, all the network. So we talked about mean time between failure. How long do you run a server at St. Martin? <laughs> uh, generally, we tend to keep them running from 10 to 12 years, which is not what you recommend is a recommended replacement of every five to six. But uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of cheap around here as far as uh, the budget goes. So we tend to run them longer than we should, but uh, they're still effective and still useful. So. Yeah. And so um, talk about um, spares and hot spares and things like that. Do you do that? Sure. Actually, we have some of those right here. We have uh, spare hard drives um, sitting in a box, ready to go. Um, that's the main thing that goes out is these mechanical hard drives. So yes, uh, Jonathan, if, uh, most servers are switching to SSDs but sometimes we need a lot of storage. So more storage means a mechanical hard drive. This particular one, we wrote an X on it because it's a bad drive. We just haven't gotten rid of it yet. You know, we, what we do is we take off the, uh, the outside uh, page and put a new drive in there, and then we can slide it into uh, a server. And then each one of these, I'm not gonna pop them out because I don't wanna break something, but you can pop these out individually and pop a new drive in there and it will uh, automatically copy from one drive to the other the data that it's missing. Um, like I said, it's a, a RAID array, they call it. Hey, Peter, I couldn't agree with you more, especially with, with if you've got hard drives that, that last more than five, six years, you, just, you leave them alone. I was gonna ask you when setting up the RAID, uh, how many drives do you guys distribute across for an average RAID setup? Um, well, typically, like, for example, this server here, we typically have these two mirrored together, and then the rest of them will be a striped array of RAID 5 or RAID 10. Um, uh, so it depends on the server. Our clusters, they use a, a separate system, uh, an array of their own that uh, it, it's kind of proprietary. They don't really conform to one of the RAID um, specs. Okay, and I, you were mentioning earlier, we, we saw Neil looking at a hard drive that may need a replacement. Um, and you mentioned that it's like an auto auto formatting. And how long does that, that uh, backup on the new drive take? Uh, the, the formatting and everything, yeah, it's usually 10 minutes maybe. Wow. Pretty it's pretty quick. Thank you. Uh, anytime you see an orange light or a red light, that means something's gone wrong and we need to fix it. So 
I'm not sure what that alarm light flash in there means, but it means it's not happy for some reason. So we'll have to go in and take a look and see what's going on. This array is about a, uh, I want to say it's seven or eight years old. So it's, uh, uh, it might be getting close to due to replacement time for it. That's our uh, security cameras around campus. And then also, you notice we have everything labeled because that way, if somebody wants to come in and, like, a, we have a contractor and we want to, and we have them hired to uh, replace something, we just say, yeah, it's in rack A. Uh, and then you say, I want it put in U number 36 or 37. All of these uh, servers, well, this one's a, a one U server. This one would be a two U because it takes up two unit of uh numbering um is it play site on that like a four use yeah um generally you don't want to put really big ones in here because because it's, there's a lot of empty space in this particular device but this is the way it came so we kind of had to deal with it uh, most of the times we'll buy just one u for two u servers uh you get perfectly adequate to computing power that that small amount. The storage arrays are usually bigger, four use, five use. Um, and then the uh, if you have one of those 6500 uh, uh, Cisco routers, those things they're 10 years, nine years, something like that. Big. Yeah. So you have a backup generator. You have those at the bottom. Or you had some uh, some UPS systems, right? Some some battery backup uh, battery uh, systems uh, right there. Okay. Yeah, we've got batteries on on both racks. Each rack has two batteries set uh, set up. Uh, one does one half of the rack, and one does the other half. Each server. Yeah, I'll pull this one up since it's turned off. You slide out so you can replace them very easily. I don't know if you can see back there now, but uh, it, it's got two plugs in the back for dual power supplies. And we will put one of those to one UPS and put the other to the other UPS. That way, if one of the UPS dies, we still have power to the server. So we won't go back. And if the power dies, how long do those last? Uh, in our uh, data centers with the uh, clusters, uh, they're designed to maybe last five minutes or so. These, we won't have so many servers running all at once, so it might last a little longer, maybe an hour. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that process yeah. question that Mark might have uh, not alluded to, but the idea that if you're on an automatic uh, backup power like that for five minutes, does it initiate an auto shutdown, uh, or is that something that you'd have to do? No, no, no. What it's supposed to do is it waits until the uh, the generator kicks on. So the generator can kick on almost immediately, but it's got to spin up and get it um, stabilized. It's a uh, generating of power. And once it does that, maybe 30 seconds or so, then it will supply that power to our servers. And so it'll be seamless. There'd be no shutdown in that. Okay. And so we use a phrase uninterruptible power supply. Th those are the ones that basically do all the sensing of what, what the condition the power is and then allows that, that system to switch over virtually instantaneously. Yeah, well, originally, like a long time ago, when they first came out with uninterruptible power supplies, that basically is a battery that would sense if something went wrong, then it would give a, a signal to the server and the server would basically shut down at that point. Uh, they they moved to a generator system, so you don't have to worry about that. Perfect. In theory, you're not supposed to worry about that. Uh, our uh, uh, power went out like two weeks ago, just before school starts, uh, for about a day and a half. And the generator, from what the uh, security people told us, because of course this happened on a weekend, so nobody was here, but the security people said, yeah, the generator kicked on, and then it stopped. <laughs> Oh, man. So we were kind of stuck. So all of our stuff went down except for the network. The network, the generator in here actually stayed on, 
so we were okay that way but our one of our big clusters that controls a lot of the stuff there on campus went down and went down hard and so when we came in on monday we had to fix that um, because it if it doesn't come up in the right order like all the servers if they don't come up in the right order uh you end up with a very very uh, unhappy cluster and nothing works so yeah we were quite busy All right, any final questions? We're almost out of time, a couple minutes here. No, just to thank you for Peter walking us through that. That looked that was pretty cool. Yeah, no problem. All right, well, if you guys think of some questions, uh, you can always email them to us. Or you can wait till next class and bring them up. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, if you think about something and uh, yeah, that's that really, it, hopefully that helps you visualize the equipment that's required to run a, a major network. And uh, it's nice for him to point out what everything does and it's, it's functionality, both network, server, uh, you know, ISP provider, uh, backup. You know, there's a lot, lot of elements that, uh, and typically the bigger the data center, the more specialized every person is one person is the network guy one person is the server guy one person is the backup guy one person is the whatever video conferencing guy or security you know or webcam you know so everybody's everybody's got their their piece of the pie and the smaller you are sometimes where you take on multiple roles with multiple hats in a data center yep mark mentioning isp i did have a quick question about the moodle set it looks like there was a assignment it might be due in a few days on subnetting and I didn't I don't know where to go for information on what we're going to, need to do for the IP subnetting. We are going to walk through all of that in detail with all of you. That's kind of like our next module. Okay. And uh, we will make sure that that homework is due after the fact, you know, to turn in once you, we've gone through the module. So yeah, not a perfect. Problem. Yeah. That was it. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here and uh, enjoy your weekend. And we will talk to you guys Tuesday. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah.